Darren and Katie, hey. would you be willing to share with us um, how you were able to live through your experiences of mental distress and how that lived experience shaped your subsequent work? Wow, I, thank you for asking that question. Um, do you, would you like to go oh, first? Or? After you, okay. I'm happy to chat. Yep. <laughs> um, well, I'm very open about the fact that I live with a major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, so for a couple of reasons. I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> I grew up in a family with a violent alcoholic father, so he was physically abusive to my mother and to <laughs> us as children. So I, uh, I'm 50 now and I still go to therapy every week because of the results of that. Um, I also inherited and um, proudly live with, but uh, a depressive disorder that comes uh, mostly from my mother's side of the family and two people in my immediate family have committed suicide. Mm. So I am very lucky that I was born in a country with an amazing healthcare system. Mm. I unfortunately live in a country at the moment with an atrocious healthcare system. Mm. And I am just always advocating uh, ab about this country and how incredibly lucky we are to have the access to this. Mm. But I really survive and am here today because of access to therapy and medication. Um, I describe my mental health condition as kind of like a superpower. It allows me to see a spectrum of <laughs> colours that I don't think everyone gets to see. I think that sometimes uh, the emotions that I feel allow me to soar to great heights and, and dive to great depths that help me in my artistry. And the question also mentioned how it affects your work. Your, your current single is called Poison Blood. Poison Blood, yeah. And it's about exactly <clears throat> that. It's about what that runs inherited... through the blood. Yeah. Yes, and I say in that song, I say, it's a blessing, a gift and a curse, but every day is a decision to stay with my poison blood. Yeah. And yeah. I know that was something that concerned you deeply during the pandemic for you, but also for friends of yours who were really struggling during that time. Yeah, honestly, look, when the pandemic started, I was just waiting for the suicides to begin. Why? Be because we just went from... We just went to nothing. And our entire... Well, economically, of course, but also just... Anyway, a connection. Uh, uh, yeah, I was I was very very worried, yeah. and I'm amazed actually at how resilient we did have you, been. Did you and others have to be very vigilant about each other? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but in answer to your question, basically, music has been my best friend since I was two, and I was lucky enough to grow up in a family that um, appreciated music and the importance of it in everyday life. My dad's a journo former ABC journo, my mum's an opera singer. So I grew up in a house that valued these things. The problem that I think we're facing at the moment, and this comes back to what I said before, is that music and arts education is not valued in this country. Only 25% of state schools have a qualified music teacher. Every single school has a PE teacher. I'm, I'm guessing, I would guess. So we have these two cultures that are integral to making a well-rounded human. And there is a plethora of research that says that music education and arts education increases numeracy, literacy, all of the things. So we know all this, but we've just never had the policy to implement it in Australia. And it is so depressing for me that 75% of state school educated kids don't have music to help them through their lives. If I didn't have music as a teenager, I'm not sure if I'd still be here. Like, I, honestly, <laughs> like it's actually yeah. has helped me so much and I've, music has helped. So that's sort of my pet dream is that we do finally have some cultural advocacy at, an, at a national level that prioritises quality music education. And the thing is, every child has an instrument, their voice. Mm -hmm. Everyone that can talk can sing. Kids aren't singing together, they're looking at screens, you know, like, for example, where I live, I'm a mum of two boys and I live on Gubby Gubby Country, the state school where our kids went to school, the music department was a joke and not prioritised at all, but they had beautiful sports fields and a great soccer thing and a basketball thing and I love those cultures as well. But it was dire, so I ended up starting my own music school. Hello, your Monday school of rockers, getting ready for our gig soon, um, because I just thought... and. We've given free scholarships to over 150 kids and the great thing is you get grammar kids and you get single mum kids, Steiner kids, the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. But in the moment they have music to help them and without it, it, seeing them bloom as young humans, 
It's just amazing. Let me, I want to bring in Renata um, Beslik now. <clears throat> Renata sent in a, a question earlier. And um, you've, you work in the industry. I think you're a, a supervisor in, in opera and theatre and you've had your own mental health struggles as well. What did you want to say here? Um, yeah, I've been in the industry 15 years. I have work in opera and theatre as a costume supervisor. Uh, I've always had mental health issues. I think it's just almost the standard in the arts. Mm. Um, we're passionate people. I think the population of people with mental health issues is more in the arts. Mm. But since the pandemic, everyone I know has struggled. A whole mm. industry is mental health has collapsed. Mm. I have, I employ people, they're struggling. My bosses are struggling, I'm struggling. And the, the, the link for you between that, that struggle, uh, that mental health struggle, and the, uh, the unreliable nature of work and gig-based economy, that's a yeah. really strong one for you, isn't it? That's when, you know, you live from gig to gig, financially you're stressing about that, mm. you're worrying about your value, you're worried it's competitive, you, you know, you're hoping you could do a good job, you're not sure, you know, I work behind the scenes, we often don't get reviews we don't we hope we're doing well mm. Mm. and finding you know suddenly all your work gone during the pandemic was unbelievably hard and never mind from financial perspective like I came into the industry because it's collaborative and social and to suddenly have that gone was just mm. so isolating mm. and you know not knowing when your next gig is going to be when you're going to get a paycheck again and it's standard all the time, but then the pandemic just made it so much worse, and it's still bad. It's still really hard. Yeah. Renata, thank you. That's a, painting a, a really pointed picture there that uh, everyone here has experienced, but you know, people at home might not know. So thank you for that. Mm. What arises from that, of course, is is the issue that we need to acknowledge, don't we, that uh, cultural workers are legitimate workers, yep. like others. <clears throat> they're, they're not hobbyists. No. And that uh, perhaps some of the, the industry settings and even the payments have reflected that, that that, mm -hmm. that isn't as serious as, say, a, um, a mine worker losing, losing their job. Yeah. So if, if the focus is going to be on how you build an arts economy that's as integral to society as manufacturing mm -hmm. or as agriculture and that's sustainable and part of any future economy, how do you do that? And I know you've said, Minister, that you're going to revive the arts policy that was Julia Gillard's. I'm just wondering if that is the right way to start, given that's a long time ago, that's pre-pandemic, the world has changed since then. Mm. So how do you do that? Yeah, we, we, we're not photocopying it and, and just reintroducing it. But that's it. going to be your entry point. That's right. Yes. That's right. And, and it's because it started with the right five principles. It started with, with First Nations, the diversity of Australia, the, cent the centrality of the artist, having strong institutions and reaching your audience. In terms of those five principles, you start with that, you've got the right foundation. Maybe a sixth need to be added, which is insecurity. Re Recognising fundamental job and uh, wage insecurity. Well, that in that the was arts. the third one, the centrality of the artist. That's not just the artist as creator, it's the artist as worker. Mm. And that goes to two things that I think have been underdone, which have both been exposed really badly over the last, last three years in particular. Um, one, and it's because of the pandemic, that's not a, a government hit, mm. um, or previous government hit, it's me now. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it's I knew because... someone was going to make that mistake. <laughs> I thought it would be me. No. <laughs> uh, but it's because, uh, one, the, the insecurity issues were just up in lights because of the pandemic. Mm. Uh, but secondly, the safe workplace issues, mm. because of Me Too, mm. uh, have been... mean that what we have to look at now uh, won't and can't simply be a photocopy of what we had before. So. What, will we be able to fix every problem? No. Should we be able to build a stronger <coughs> foundation? I believe we can. All right, let's move on to our next question. But if this discussion has raised any issues for you, remember the numbers for Lifeline and Beyond Blue are there on your screen. We're always happy to speak openly about mental health challenges, but that, of course, can raise issues. So please take advantage of those services.